Hello, dear friends. This is Kardec Radio at 11 p.m. Nourishing our souls together. We are here for one more chapter from the book Jesus in the Home by the spirit author Neil Lúcio through the medium Chico Xavier, a book that was written in 1949 and comes to us in its beautiful format so we can learn more from the Master right chapter 37 today is titled the idol son well in the spirits book by Allan Kardec when we study about the law of work which is a law of the universe we we hear Kardec asking and we write and we read what was written by Kardec but he actually asked this question verbally to the spirits through the mediums of the time how can we define work? And the definition of the good spirits is revolutionary because work is not a job. It's not something that we are paid for. According to the illuminated spirits, work is every useful occupation. Every useful occupation. So right now, if you are studying this book together, we're together, it's useful, right? We're working. Oh no, Vanessa, I'm so tired of work and I want to be working. I know, but this is a different type of work. It's the real work, right? It's the one in which we nourish our souls. We're being useful, like a worm. The worm is aerating, aerating the, the, the soil of the earth, being very useful not even aware of it. The beauty of it all is that we can be useful without even noticing, right? But we're talking about put consciousness, putting consciousness into this. So we're being invited tonight to revisit the concept of laboring, the law of work in the universe, being useful and as we're working. But Jesus tonight is calling us for a little more than that. And welcome, dear friends, to Kardec Radio. We are here nourishing our souls together, right, Daisy? Big hug to you, Daisy. Carol Correa, big hug to you. Rafael Medeiros, how have you been? So, Souza, how are you and Luana? Sunshine, how have you been? Raquel Bakeshi, welcome, dear soul. John De Rosa, you're super welcome here. And we have Nora Brasil with us. Quentin, how are you? Haven't seen you here before. Welcome. Thank you, soul. So, you know the teacher is our master Jesus. Are you ready? Feel, let us feel, as new disciples, as Emmanuel says in the preface of this book, let us feel ourselves seated around Jesus. He's going to share another lesson, verbally and non-verbally, so we can follow his guidance and emulate him. Like Ben Franklin said, imitate Jesus, right? Hello, Livia Moraes and Jacob. How have you been? Ready? Chapter 37, The Idol Son. The small group was discussing various problems of faith in God. When Jesus began narrating complacently, this is so interesting before we keep going, because our dear Neil Lucio is talking about a small group. And let's put a pause here. Huh? You're talking about the Messiah. The Messiah having gatherings with a small group. Why are we emphasizing this? Because I know many people who do not value small groups or gatherings mm. in small groups. They think it's only worthwhile and impacting when you have thousands of but the master, in his humility, the governor of the planet, stopped 
in the evening with a small group and kindly sharing the lessons. I think we're not humble enough yet because we're still thinking of grandiose ideas. And did you know in psychology, when we have that need of big, great, thousands of people need, it's because our ego is still too big. We need to go humble. The governor of the planet is teaching us tonight, amongst other things, that to be useful starts in a small group, in your house, in your relationships, in our relationships. It doesn't begin going to a big celebrity show. It doesn't begin when we are in the mainstream news. As a wise spiritist friend said in his Facebook the other day, you know, it's good that spiritism is not widely spread nowadays in the mainstream. You know why? Because people would misuse it would probably abuse it and destroy the works. So we are at the right pace, in the right way in the world, because the plans come from Christ, doesn't come from us. We cannot, we, you and I, as spiritists, we cannot contemplate how we're gonna disseminate it, because it's not on us to plan this out. The soldier does not plan anything. We just fulfill the tasks that were delivered to us. It is on Jesus and his team to actually plan it out. So when I see people gathering together to plan how we're going to get to do things and disseminate, we're wasting our time. Why? Because Spiritism is the promised consoler. And we're here to help the people who are in need. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, socially. It's not on us to plan. Not, we're not saying about the planning of a Spiritist Center, the planning of a meeting. We're talking about the dissemination. It's not on us to plan it out. We just need to do like Chico Xavier. Look at Chico. Have you ever heard of Chico Xavier gathering together with all the presidents of Spiritist Centers and telling them what to do, how to best disseminate? Has, ever, has Emmanuel ever written a book on how to disseminate best Spiritism? No, because it's an illusion. And it doesn't come from us, right? I agree, Livia, people already misuse it, but imagine if it goes to a worldwide scale, right? The people who misuse it, it's almost imperceptible when we put into the worldwide perspective, right? People barely feel it, but imagine if the world's attention got to it we would be in pretty bad shape, right? Right? Yes, Gabriel Inácio is mentioning here, the plan comes from God and it does not come from us. So what do we need to do? Just do what Chico Xavier used to do. He would visit people in their homes. He would receive the people who would come to their homes and Jesus is our model. So Neil Lucio is saying, Forget the big plans, focus on the small groups. If at every meeting that you have, you feel the presence of the good and loving spirits, we're already doing our best. Feeling the presence of the loving and kind spirits, the master of all masters was in a small group and allowed people to discuss the problems of faith when he began narrating 
complacently right Dulce let's see how he did it a great sovereign owned vast domains there were countless lands rivers plantations orchards and herds in his prodigious kingdom innumerable subjects served his house in all areas some of them never left their lord's sight for very long from time to time they would visit the, his palace offering the king that sovereign their service or the flowers of their affection as they received their new schedules for constructive work others however lived as they saw fit in the constructive work in the immense woodlands they prized their complete freedom with an obvious lack of discipline. They were real troublemakers in the vast empire because instead of helping nature, they spoiled it without mercy. They killed the animals for mere pleasure of hunting. They poisoned the waters to kill mass quantities of fish. They chased after birds or burned the crops of the faithful servants, even though deep down they knew they should obey the Almighty Lord. One of these thoughtless and idle subjects, however, did not completely disregard his belief in the existence and goodness of the king. After lengthy adventures in the forest to kill defenseless birds, when his belly was already filled to the brim, he would comment on his faith in the rich owner on, of the vast and valuable realm. A sovereign as generous as the one who made the waters. The lands, the trees, and the flocks must be very wise and just, he would explain conscientiously but he tactfully avoided every decree. He intended to leave his own way without any rules, not even those of the one who, that had given him the valley in which he was living his luxurious and happy existence. After a number of years had gone by, when his hands were unable to lift the smallest weapon to harm nature, when his foggy eyes were unable to make out the landscape with the same clarity as when he was young, when his tired and sad body was bent over towards the ground, he decided to seek out the Lord in order to ask for his protection and support. He crossed beautiful fields where the loyal, hard-working, and happy servants were cultivating the soil of the immense state. Finally, he arrived at the illuminated home of the sovereign. He was greatly surprised to find that the guards wouldn't let him in because they couldn't find his name in the book of active servants. He implored, begged, and whined. However, one of the guards remarked the king's spare time is set aside for his workers what do you mean cried the lazy subject i have always believed in the sovereignty and kindness of our glorious ruler what but the guard retorted without blinking an eye what good was such a conviction a conviction if you avoided the decrees of our sovereign, wasting invaluable time upsetting his works. Our past is alive in your current situation. Your past is alive in your current situation. What good did it do to trust in the Lord if you never came to him offering one minute of collaboration on behalf of everyone else? So you should see that your belief was merely a way of appeasing your conscience for the follies of your heart. And the subject now compromised by his unworthy deeds 
and in the poorest of physical health was forced to begin his task from scratch for his own spiritual renewal. The master fell quiet for a few minutes and then concluded. This is a picture of every idle child of God. Will any healthy will any healthy and intelligent persons who believe in the existence of the eternal Father, who recognize his power, justice, and goodness through the physical expressions of nature, but who do not come to him in a simple prayer from time to time or honor his laws with the smallest gesture of aid for their fellow beings, or who do not show the smallest trace of interest in the designs of the great sovereign, be able to reap any reward from their dead, pointless convictions? With this question, which silenced his listeners, the evening's gospel worship came to a close. Assessment question number one to us. Are we idle? Are we lazy? I'm going to use the words that Jesus used in the story. Let us think. I think a yes or no answer does not help us. We need rating, inner rating. So if we don't feel the scriptures, there is no use. Let us rate the level of our idleness or laziness. We may not be 100%, of course, or we wouldn't be here together now. But let us measure internally. Am I being as useful as possible? All the time? Or just a few hours a day? There are people who spend, who spend eight hours at work. But the real useful hours, when they are really working and useful, it's like two hours. The other six just pretending. Many people do this. They sit at their desk and they stay there. Not necessarily they are working. Of course, no wonder there is a movement for our work. Because they say at the end of the day, people don't actually work eight hours straight. They do a little bit and then distract themselves. A little bit, distract themselves. There are certain jobs in which you can't distract yourself, especially if you're a caregiver. It may be very intense, but there are other ways in which we are useful but not so useful. We stop, gossip, go back. Now with social media, many people bring their cell phones and they're allowed to use at work. So they are working, texting, whatsapping, messengers on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, etc. So at the end of the day, are we really useful? How useful have you been? Have we been? How idle have you we been? And then you may ask, but what is that to do with our faith in God? You see the catch here? It's fascinating. Jesus is talking to a small group. And why is Neo Lucio emphasizing that, putting in the first line of the first paragraph to say, you can be useful in whatever envir environment, small or large. In one in which the cameras can see and others that the cameras cannot see. Especially on the ones that the cameras cannot see. And he's tying up our usefulness, our labor-driven attitude, correlating that with our faith in God. So, if we have faith in God, we cannot stay idle. We need to work. We need to be useful. So 
A good exercise for us in the next 24 hours is the following. Everything we're going to do, we ask. Is this going to be useful to me and to the general public in general, like family, workplace, community? Is it or not? Oh, I'm going to rest a little bit. Well, if you go to the Spirit's book, Kardec asked, what is the limit of work, right? And he said, the limit of your forces. We have to rest. Oh, but right now, right now, I, I feel I need a break. Okay, break, coffee break. But then you put consciousness into it. That's the difference. So of all the things that we're learning with Jesus, he's teaching us to be aware of it and saying, come on, let us put mind over matter and lead ourselves into the fulfillment of our tasks, of the things we need to do. Putting consciousness. It's so interesting because when you look at the schedule that Chico Xavier had, Professor Lipitz Barsonu for Devaldo Franco, we're gonna see that they really work many hours, especially Chico Xavier. And when you see the schedule that Professor Lipitz Barsanufo had from 4 a.m. to 10 p.m., a very detailed schedule helping so many people by the letters, the pharmacy, the school, the spirit center, and then in the streets of the very city of Sacramento and the neighboring cities. But we cannot compare ourselves to these spirits of high stature, but we can be encouraged by pushing a little more, right? And not judging ourselves, but saying, oh, well, I can be more useful during the day at work. Instead of being there and like, oh, I'm so bored. Why do children talk about being bored all the time? Because adults say it all the time, right? Bully exists in school because their children are bullied at home. Because if children are not bullied at home, they won't be bullied in school. They won't be bullies in school. It begins at home. So it's on us to shift gears and practice being useful in our smallest settings. Home is number one. Often, talking about laziness, we come from work or from outside and we're dreaming of laying down, sitting, doing nothing. But that's because we are not mastering our physiology. We go to the streets, do our things without mastering. So a good tip for us, relaxation breathing. Dr. Herbert Benson from Harvard, I keep repeating it because it's one of the most fantastic research I've ever read. Dr. Herbert Benson shows to us that we have this inner relaxation capacity. So if I spend my day at work in a mindful manner, breathing deeply, to boost the relaxation breathing. When I come home, I won't go home like, and I have to throw my body on the couch and be there, frustrated. Oh my gosh. Because I'll learn to recharge wherever I am. I will learn to take care of my physical body wherever I am breathing for those who are not familiar with the relaxation breathing 
it goes by like this. You breathe in through the nose, count to four. Hold it, count to seven. And then breathe out to eight. Four, seven, eight. And you inhale, inflating the lower abdomen, not the thorax, okay? Deeply breathing in, slowly breathing out. Let us practice three times. Again. One more time. When we learn to do the relaxation breathing, we're activating the relaxation response inside of us, which is driven by the parasympathetic system inside of us. And that's the opposite system of the flight or flight, which is the stress system, right? So when we learn to do this breathing wherever we are, when we come home, we don't need to prostrate ourselves there for many hours because we'll be in charge of our physical body. Let's say you are in a social gathering and you feel like you're kind of draining yourself out. Go to the bathroom and breathe in deeply. While you're breathing, you can pray. Dr. Heber Benson recognizes that prayer changes the breathing rhythm, promoting this relaxation breathing. So I breathe in, hold it, breathe out. And by doing so, I am nourishing my cells, changing my mold, and then as I shift my mind and my physiology, I can still be useful where I am. So when I go home, I won't be fighting with my family because who has the right to rest when we get home? If any of us feel the greater right than the other, we're going to be battling at home. So learning to recharge ourselves during the day when we get to our small gathering like Jesus, because we know that God is so great, we say, God, you already recharged me. I know the good and loving guardian angels protecting spirits are recharging me. Let me be useful to my family. Let me love my family a little more. Let me give them a little more of my loving care. Shall, shall we? Yes? Gabriel and Nancy say, I do need to be more useful at home. I must change my manners and serve myself at home. My wife says it's no use being charitable to others and with us. Great. Gabriel. Thank you for sharing this, and we pray that you get the strength to doing it. Good job for realizing it. And it's charity to really be kind to people at home. And not only kind, but giving people a break. Right? Right? Our dear Quentin is saying, uh, Thank you so much for your feedback. Thank you for being here with us. I, I hear your message. I can read it. And thank you for sharing this. That's okay. Thank you for sharing with us. Okay, Quentin. So for us tonight, how can we maximize being useful? First of all, take care of the physical body. Breathing in and out in a relaxation breathing will nourish our physical cells so we'll be set to be more useful. 
but being useful begins in the mind so we can be useful by thinking well feeling well right visualizing the good that's being useful Chico Xavier used to go to sleep sometimes very late many times and often we've heard many stories he would lay down and would start praying for people so he would pray for the neighbor the other neighbor the other street the neighbor of the other and then he would pray 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 and usually we got the reports that um, he prayed for so many people that when he noticed it was already sunrise that's a way of being useful. You know when you wake up in the middle of the night and you have nothing else to do? And you're like having that insomnia? I remember Nate Mentor Joseph saying, pray. So I'm there and then I start praying. Laying down. Praying for the friends, for the not so friends, for the future friends, <laughs> for the people in the news, the people at work, etc. And then you pray, pray, pray. You pray so much, you get so tired, you go back to sleep. <laughs> and then you go back to sleep, breathing and praying, breathing and praying. Okay, friends? So, thank you, Jesus. That's our prayer to Jesus today. Thank you, Jesus, for encouraging us to be more useful right we love you because you are always encouraging us to do more to be more useful to be partaking the feast of god's love in the universe don't you love god god is so good god is so good god is so good he's so good to us right friends tomorrow when we come back we're gonna study another chapter chapter with jesus justifiable argumentation is there any i don't know let's see what jesus is gonna teach thank you livia thank you so much dulce thank you friends until tomorrow god willing